Okay, that's a standout track from one of my favorite bands. 38 years these guys have been together making great music. It's a song called Sweat, which kicked off their first official LP back in 1983. And uh, we are honored to have on the show once again, Joe Kelly Radio. The great system, the system with David Frank and Mike Murphy. How you doing, fellas? Great. Doing great, How Joe. Yeah, thanks to come out, and uh, we haven't spoken in a few years, and a lot has changed with everybody, but you guys are still making fantastic music, and uh, what, what's it been like since since March or whenever you guys kind of went into the, the hub or the bubble? Well, it's been okay. You know, it's kind of just uh, a lot of opportunity to write more music. <laughs> <How's that? laughs> right. And you both have home studios, right? Yes. Yep. Yes, we do. We, we're gonna, but you know what we miss is, you know, we would go East Coast, West Coast every month or so, uh, you know, to work on the record. So right. kind of missing that where, right. you know, we would, you know, we send the music back and forth to each other. But then we get together to kind of refine it a little bit um, right. and kind of talk each other through in the same room, which is always... You know, it's always great. It's always, I'm not, it's always a little better. Yeah. And, and Dave has been out in California. How many, how many years have you been out there? Um, I've been out here for a long time, actually, since the early nineties. Oh, okay. But, but we've, but like Mike said, we'd go back and forth. You know, I went to New York a lot. He came, he'd come out here. So. Right. It was, uh, you got, you guys both, both chose the two most expensive places around, right? <laughs> to live. Um, yeah, I suppose. But... Yeah. <laughs> so you're talking about music and, and the, the great new track, the video that's up on YouTube, People Get Up from the System, featuring yeah. uh, Sandra St. Victor and Grandmaster Melly Mel. Talk about you guys collaborating on this, and, and it really hits for times like these. Right. Yeah, well, I mean, Mike, go ahead. Okay, so... Um... We actually got together, I guess it's like about two years ago, Dave, in L.A. Because like I said, we would, I would go to L.A., he would come to New York, and we would get in the same room and at least, you know, kind of start, start cooking up some cooking up material. Dave would, would, might have a few tracks that he already started and play, play them for me. And, um, you know, I'd be out there probably for a week, and over the course of that week, I'd add ideas to what he started and we'd get together to kind of collaborate. So this was one of those from two and a half years ago. And um, at the time it was like a lot of the civil unrest of black lives matter movement right. were reaching a peak. And um, I kind of think it was around the Michael Brown era. I'm not exactly sure what the events were, but I was watching TV and I was listening to the track and automatically the idea started popping into my head. Um, not just as, uh, as adding fuel to the fire of black lives matter, but, um, to bring about a sense of awareness that we have to come together to end this, um, to end, end kind of the disparities and the discrimination that goes on in the eyes of, you know, of, of police and in the eyes of people not understanding the vulnerabilities of, of people who, who get stopped for a broken traffic light and end up dead mysteriously. So, you right. know, part of what David and I have always done, and it's strange because recently we had a conversation about race and mm -hmm. I'm telling you for 35 years, we've never had the conversation. We just wow. never have. It's never, it's never come up. And um, it, it got me thinking that, you know, it's, it's kind of always been there, but, you know, and I talked to a lot of musicians that, you know, you create love songs and you're kind of afraid to discuss anything that's out of the realm of, you know, you just want to be safe a little bit with the music, not that the music is safe, but the message is safe. Right. And I think, we'd had enough of that and it was time to say something um, that had to do with social discourse. No, I was going to say, you know, it is, it is, I think that Mike 
you know, to, to a certain extent, there was, there is a feeling on with, with many people that, you know, that things, that things are good, that you, that in your mind, you don't, that, that race, that race isn't really considered, you know? And then of course, you know, over the last few years, it's sort of been, there's sort of been permission to just uh, maybe access the, 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 what I consider the worst part of people. And it's, it's sort of like been sort of given permission, tacit permission that that's okay. And it's not. And of course there is still a lot of racism. And so it's good for, you know, Mike and I have worked together for years and it's, we're working on music together and it's doesn't, we never, we, it's not as if we never, you know, came across, had situations where all of a sudden it was like, Oh, you know, I remember one time it's like, well, you know, he doesn't, that, that guy, someone in the music business, he's not really that crazy about us because he doesn't really want a white person involved in black music or, or vice versa, obviously is mostly the case. So, but may, but most of the time we just kind of like went, Oh, the heck with it. You know, we're just, we're just doing this. I mean, this is what we're doing because this is the modern world and we are, we are the modern world. And that was part of the incentive maybe to, you know, Mike always says to call the group, the system and say, the system is usually considered a bad thing, but we are the, the new way of doing things where it, where it just doesn't, things like that don't matter. And we work together to make better, to make music, to make music better. And I think it's really interesting. Your, your backgrounds musically, Dave, you, I know you, you were playing classical music growing up in, but you were really into funk music, a white guy getting into the funk world. And, and Mike, you played in all these funk R&B bands, but you were always looking to, to England and electronics and, uh, you know, mostly white world over there. So you guys brought it together, make the system. It's a really cool story. That I think to a certain extent we go, oh, yeah, yeah, that, yeah, that's true. And it's and it's true because it's a story and stories are good to have. Mm -hmm. But we always kind of went, you know, we're, we're just going beyond the story. We're just, we're, we're really making music. It's not, this is not just about, this isn't about just two people. Okay. We're different. So we're going to decide to work together. No, it's just, right. Oh, well, we want to make music together. That's all it's, you know, to an extent. Yeah. So, so for a band like the system, you know, getting together and working together, you guys in 82. And then uh, the same kind of story. And I mean, Mike talked, we were talking off air about the game has changed. You, do you think it'd be that difficult to get noticed and, and become a, a major act that quickly today? Absolutely. I, don't, I, well, I think okay. it would be. Well, here, let's put it this way. Artists that are big today they didn't start yesterday they started mm -hmm. five years ago building up their following releasing you know just releasing music in a different way so it's not like the 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 largesse happened overnight for even a lot of the artists that we see now i mean they've been digging five six seven eight years just building up everything the same thing we were we were out there grinding we just didn't have a record but we were grinding and, you know, we had the intention of making records. So, you know, we'd have to have started this new record like five years ago. Right. <laughs> Basically, right. because, you know, as we're, and as we're seeing now, how important it is to build up a platform and followers on that platform, because it's part and parcel to how you distribute it and play and, and um, reach, get reach with your music. You know, in some ways, we're left a little, we left a little bit out of the pocket because you know when when we started out, we were playing a lot of bands, we were meeting a lot more people, we were a lot more, you know, reachable, and and we came up kind of in a generation where you kind of maintain some sense of privacy. You know, you didn't you didn't broadcast every meal you ate, you didn't broadcast you walking your dog, you didn't broadcast, right. and now you kind of have to do that in order to get the kind of reach you need to really get your music out there. They say you got to put yourself out there, which is kind of what, you know, we found to be a little bit different than what happened during our heyday. Yeah. I, I mean, I, I have to agree with that. And then also add that, you know, there's, I think that there's 
even even then and now there's exceptions to every sort of convention of thought about how you achieve quote success and i think back then there were also many many bands trying for years to be successful now the the uh the the actual real thing that you really need of course is magic in the music and mm -hmm in a in the form of a hit song in the form of actual notes and melodies and beats that move people emotionally and physically and there were many people who were trying to build up fan bases in the ways that were available at that time and we were that was really our story at the time although we individually were working on music all the time and most most people that are making music have been doing it for years they're trying to get better at their craft and then they have maybe a moment or sometimes more than a moment when they achieve it and they and we had that moment and so that our story about like you know recording a song one night before we went in the studio uh, doing writing a song the night before then being in the studio for one day and then getting a record deal the next day and having the song on the radio in a month was a rare thing back then. Those kind of things right. still happen now in the mm -hmm. form of, um, I know that my, my, uh, my daughter's boyfriend has a song that has, he wrote the track to someone else wrote a melody to it and it has gotten 17 million uh, streams on Spotify in a few weeks. Wow. So, and this is a person who's 14 years old who lives in a rural area and made a video in his bedroom. So, wow. and it's, but it's an unusual piece of work. It's not really a music. It's not mm -hmm. about the music. It's about the, the somewhat about the, the visual and about, and about the uh, amateur quality of it that is just perfect for the moment. Right. You know, so there are, there are many exceptions to the rule now and then there are there were then too so i guess that's my only point and the missing thing of course the, the most important thing is having something magical in the music itself yeah always nice to speak with these guys david frank and mike murphy of the system one of my all-time favorite groups and they're making new music people get up we're going to play that a little later into the interview right now but we're going to go to uh your last full-length release, which was an outstanding record, System Overload, and the track is mm. No Fear of Flying, which, uh, Great. you know, tell us about this track. This is one of my favorite ones off, off, off this cut, off this record. No Fear of Flying. Yeah. Uh -huh. David, you go in. Yeah. You know, No Fear of Flying is like, it's, it's just a fantastic track. You know, just someone, I mean, just... Someone on on uh, on Instagram, um, I can't remember the person, Mike. I know you've seen this video before. Also, is like doing oh, kind of like I guess a thing where he's singing it in the car, and you know, I guess maybe it's for TikTok. I don't know, whatever whatever TikTok is, I'm not exactly sure, but it is something. So there's you know, he's singing the song "Fear of Flying" in the car, and it just reminded me how you know, no fear of flying. Is, has like a little bit of the character of Don't Disturb This Groove and other mm -hmm. songs of that type where we that we've had, even You're In My System and I Can't Take Losing You from the Experiment album, um, right. where they have, where it has a chorus that can just go on and on and feels like you're kind of floating freely somehow above everything and feeling euphoric. And it does, it achieves that feeling. So let's give a listen to it right now and also give you the particulars. You can go to the systemmusic.com and the new track. You, you can download it from Bandcamp, I think. Yes, Bandcamp. Okay. A any other spots for the new track? People get up the system? Well, you know, that's another thing we learned that it takes a while once you release things for it to be available on all the platforms. So at this point now, today, as we sit, it's available on all music platforms. Okay, cool. So. Get up. Uh, we'll get into it right now. You also can get this whole uh, release, System Overload LP, and this is the track called No Fear of Flying. David Frank and Mike Murphy coming back in just a moment on Joe Kelly Radio. Thank you, Joe. That's No Fear of Flying from the system. Mike Murphy and David Frank join us, and I'm, I'm really honored to have them. That's from System Overload here on Joe Kelly Radio. And, you know, I've told the guys this before, but, you know, 
I got into radio. I got out of high school about June of 1982. And I think right around that time, you guys released It's Passion. And that's when I got into yeah. DJing, right? The summer of 82. And it just, you know, your music. I've got to thank you once again. It just so influential on uh, my musical career behind, behind the mic. Wow. Oh, that's great. Yeah, and being in New York City, I went to NYU that September. And, you know, we talked about it. It was just blowing up on all the stations there and Frankie Crocker. And, yeah, right. you know, man. Yeah, you, I mean, you think back to those days and it, it must be amazing how we talked about, let's first talk about its passion. Maybe that'll build the story up again about okay, sure. you guys recorded it. And the next day we're hustling the song and let's talk about that. Okay. Um, you know, I'll, I'll start and then Mike can continue. You know, the track, the, what, what had, what had happened in the previous, like six months before that, um, you know, I was playing in a lot of record. I was playing with a lot of different bands, including Madonna, who was not famous at the time, you know, yet. Mm -hmm. Um, and a lot of other bands and playing synthesizer and piano on, you know, and doing sessions um, for people like Lenny White, uh, the drummer from Return to Forever. You probably know him from. And um, anyway, so but I got, you know, a hold of a, a I bought a DSX, an Oberheim DSX, which is a sequencer, which is basically like musicians out there know logic, logic, uh, logic, which is uh, logic or Ableton. It's like a, a sequencer, but it doesn't have, it didn't play drums. It just played uh, MIDI. It didn't have, there wasn't MIDI. It actually did it with control voltage and gate, but it did actually, you could actually play something and it would play back what you played on the instrument, not a recording. So I got that. And then I finally got my hands on a DMX, which was a drum machine, which went with it along with the Oberheim uh, OBXA. And I had a mini Moog and I made a, a track I started making tracks and I did a couple of them before but then I focused all my energy on one track and I had some studio time and Madonna was going to sing Madonna came up with a melody for my track which I spent by the way a month you know right. writing mm -hmm. um it wasn't quick and I and I spent a long time doing it and then the night before we were going in the studio and Madonna had a melody a melody she was singing on it and lyrics and the night before we were going in the studio, she called me and said, Frankie, she called me Frankie. I can't do this because my friend, Steve Bray, who you, maybe, you know, Steve right. Bray too. Yeah. He's a very good friend of mine now too. So, and Mike, so uh, he, you know, he's, he's upset that I'm going to do this with you. And so I'm, unless he can co-produce it, you know, I don't want to do it. So I said, okay, well, I don't want to do that because I want it to be all electronic. I got up and I went, okay, well, that's it. You don't have to do it. And so I called. Then I thought, who am I going to get? I need to get. And I remembered Mike Murphy, who I had heard singing um, and was just blown away by. So I, so I called him and, and he said, okay, I'm going to take the day off from work tomorrow and I'm going to do this. And we went down to the studio and I played him the track. And then go ahead, Mike. <laughs> well, here. yeah, so... He called me over the night before, actually, and said, hey, I have this track, but the catch is, we got to record it tomorrow. <laughs> so, <laughs> I was like, okay. <laughs> so not knowing, you know, I knew David because um, we initially met through the band Clear. When right, they were looking right. for a keyboard player, and I, I was like, uh, my mentor was this guy, or is this guy, Dennis King, who was a mastering engineer at Atlantic. So he said, hey, I'm, I'm going to see this singer, was it Andy Lerner, David? Andy Lerner, the singer? Name, yeah. Yeah. I, I want to go see this singer, Andy Lerner. Come with me. So we went to this club on the Upper East Side, I think, Upper West Side. And um, I just kept noticing David's playing. Um, and I knew that Claire needed a keyboard player. So I was like, Dennis, I mean, that, you know, the keyboard player is really good. Maybe you should try to get him for Clear. And as it turned out, um, David ended up as the keyboard player on the road with the group clear where I was the road manager and sound man. So okay. I didn't know anything else about the type of music or the style of music he was playing. Um, so when he invited me to the studio, I was really shocked and surprised because 
it was exactly the style of high energy electro um, that I'd been listening to kind of coming out of the UK and he had it all there. And I was like, this is, this is amazing. So right. I knew then I, this was the moment to actually put my whole thing on the table. And I just started singing like a little chorus, a little hook. I didn't have any of the other words or any of the other parts. He was like, all right, that's great. That's great. I mean, this happened in like the course of maybe 15 minutes, yeah, um, okay. probably seven or eight o'clock at night. So that's great. That's great. So finish writing it. And then I'll pick you up tomorrow. And we'll go to the studio. I don't know why you had the confidence that I could actually write <laughs> uh, <laughs> I don't know. melody, the lyrics. And right. I mean, if you know, in times of passion, this was a song with, with moments. This was mm -hmm. a song with interludes. This was a song with an intro. And I mean, it's, it was, it, yeah. there's a lot going on in there. <laughs> but, but I guess I had been writing that song my whole life because it just, yeah. it poured out of me. It just poured out of me that night. And the next day he picked me up. We went to the studio. We recorded it that day, did the vocals, the background vocals, mixed it. I think we left the studio like, I don't know, one or two o'clock in the morning. Yeah. Maybe even later. Um, later. Yeah. I got home. Yeah. Cause I kind of remember it was kind of dawn, right? Four yeah. Well, five. Um, so at the time I lived in my mother's basement and I had, you know, full band gear and a, and a, really good sound system down there. And mm -hmm. I remember putting the cassette on and just saying to myself, this is it. This is, this is, no one can deny this. This is it. So that morning um, I called Dennis King and uh, I met him at Atlantic studios um, on Broadway and what is it? 59th street, 60th street yep. at yep. the mastering studio. And he cut three acetates, mm -hmm. one of which I still have. And I had met two or three people in the record business because of my work with Clear and because I was kind of more in the industry and meeting people all the time. Um, I met Jim Delahant and uh, Ray Caviano. So they were two people that I knew who had said to me, if you ever come up with something, you know, give me a call. I'd love to hear it. So okay. I called them that morning about 10, 11 o'clock. They said, sure, come over. Both of them were very receptive. Uh, first, I met. Ray Caviano, whose office was just down the street from Atlantic Records, uh, Atlantic Studios. Um, so I went to see him. I played him the acetate. He said, oh, I love it. I love it. I want to put this out. I said, OK, well, I have one more meeting and I'll get back to you and let you know. So that meeting was with Jim Delahant. God rest, God rest his soul. He passed away um, earlier this year. Okay. Um, so I went to Atlantic Records at The Rock. Went upstairs into the office. He said, oh, sure, come in, come in, come in. Play me, play me what you have. So I played him about 30 seconds of it. And he said, hold on just a minute. Hold on. So he goes into the back through a door and out comes a giant of the music business who I had respected for a long time because he was the youngest president in the history of Atlantic Records. You know, he signed Led Zeppelin, Cream. He, he signed so many of the big rock bands that I was enamored of. Um, and he comes into the room, he sits down in a chair um, with his back facing me. Um, he puts the record on and about a minute later, he turns around with this big giant smile on his face. And he said, you've got yourself a record deal. So I go downstairs. I'm like, I'm blowing up with excitement inside. I go downstairs to a phone booth and I call David. And then by this time, it's probably what? One o'clock, 1230. I said, Someone. David. Yeah. I said, we have a record deal. Now, we didn't, even have, we didn't even have a name. We hadn't thought that part out. Um, yeah. So that's how quickly it happened for us. And then it was on the radio in three and a half weeks. Yeah. Now, now who was Frankie Crocker the first one to break it in, you know, yes. major market? Yes. Okay. Yes, Frankie Crocker. Yes. Yeah. You know, we're friends with uh, Chris Jasper from the Isaac Brothers. Yes. And, oh, yeah, yeah. You know, every time he they come to the studio his, his wife margie she was the music director at bls i don't know if uh, you ever met his wife oh wow. i remember I her about, name i remember yeah, her name yeah 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 so margie. Uh, margie yeah and i because i mentioned frankie crocker she goes oh you know i used to be the music director at bls i said thank you because there was so much great music coming out <laughs> right and yeah oh, and it was yeah. a promotion since we're mentioning names there was a guy named juggy gale who was a okay. promotion guy who took it Yogi Gale, yeah. 
Didn't your Chucky. uncle know him or something, David? What was well, he, he was actually he actually worked as a promotion guy when my aunt Mildred was working for Irving Berlin in the late 40s. And wow. he was that old then in the 80s. Wow. He was like he was like almost 80 years old and he was still promoting wow. dance records and he would show up at wow. the dance clubs Paradise Garage at five in the morning. Yeah. <laughs> this yep. guy was not he was 80 <laughs> years old. And what is no nuts about music? Juggy, what, was he built like a jug? No, he was this oh. little oh, was, this little guy when when they was, what was he like five foot two maybe yeah, yeah like just a little <laughs> on a good little, day in heels. <laughs> yeah. Look look him up. He had a he had a record label that actually did really well even after that. He oh, had yeah. this label yeah. dance label thing that he had. Anyway, wow. yeah, so that's just an aside. But so yeah, that's the story of its passion, and then it became yeah. a big hit. In so, you know, so, so I got asked. I got asked Frankie this question: Did Madonna ever say uh, I missed out on a big hit? Yes. Oh, oh okay. that's right. She when I came when I came back when I dropped Mike off at his at his mom's house in Queens. We the studio we did it at was called Bolognese Studio. It was out in Long Island, and when I, dro I drove back in in the morning, like Mike said, it was the morning, and I drove back in, and. I stopped at the music building and um, which is the place where I had my, I had a loft that I shared and yeah. Madonna was living in the hallway. She, she had not literally, she was borrowing quarters for apple juice. She didn't have anything. Wow. And she, and I played it for her in the hallway of the music building. And these hallways were like kind of cockroach infested. I don't know why we were, we were sitting on the floor. I remember. And she started banging her fists on the on the floor and going, "Damn it! I can't believe it! I could have had a hit. You're gonna, wow. you guys are gonna get a record deal with this." And this is before Mike called me. And then when wow. I got home and I was playing, I was playing it for my for my girlfriend. Then he called me, and it was like, sure enough, we had a record deal. She was, yeah, she was upset that she hadn't done it, but it was wow. nothing like it might not have been a success. Mike is. You know, yeah, yeah. Mike, I Mike mean, did it completely differently than she, right? Than she exactly, it's like totally different. So it's your song, both of you guys, nobody else's. So yeah, we're gonna get into it right now. We're here, Joe Kelly Radio, Mike Murphy and David Frank, the duo known as the System. They got into it in 1982 and are still here making great music. And we'll talk a little later on about their new album, which is uh, gonna be coming out hopefully uh, very shortly or not too far off. But uh, let's yeah. give it a listen right here. It's passion, the system. Yeah. All right, another great song. That was the first hit from the system. It's passion and uh, was is also on the album Sweat. David Frank and Mike Murphy here joining us on Joe Kelly Radio. And um, before we talk about what's going on today, 19, I believe it was uh, 84, you guys produced a record for Attitude. And did you guys wow. produce it? Uh, you know, that's another great record. Was it because you had so many songs that, you know, obviously you couldn't put out two or three records a year? What was uh, the thinking behind that? <laughs> well, we kind of invented it. So once again, Frankie Crocker, he mm -hmm. would always say on his radio show, we got the juice, right, David? Right. That's right. He did say that. Right. Well, right. Out of his slogan. So just to, just to rewind the, the pages, Back then, you actually could record and get a record out in a week. Now, okay. I mean, yeah, you can do that now, but then, then you could actually do that if there was the slogan that people were saying on the street, or if there was, you know, some kind of hook that was on another record that didn't make a hit. You could kind of cut it. So we made this song. David had a track, and I used the "We Got the Juice" hook. And um, we said, wow, you know, because Prince had his little offshoots. And I was like, we could do That's that, right. too, David. We could do yeah. that. I was we like, we're going to we're going to make attitude. Right, and right. Um, we had we had been working with Cindy Mizell and Chris mm -hmm. Kello, who's a fantastic okay. keyboard player, actually, who toured with us and, you know, continues to be a friend, a great friend to this day. Um, so we put together this group with one single thinking that that would be it. But the single took off in New York. So they came right. back and said, hey, you guys want to make an album. Right, Dave? It was a similar right. situation. That's right. We did that on uh, the label. was It was RFC. I think it was on RFC. 
Right. And and we oh, had we had, had by that time we had had You're in My System was a big song on on BLS and all those stations too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know so. what? I kind of I remember now I piggybacked that because after we had a hit with this passion, <laughs> Ray came, Ray came and said, You owe me one. <laughs> you, you owe me a record. Because <laughs> right. that was supposed to be my record. He started beating his right, fist right. on right. the floor, on the floor of the music building. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> no. Right. <laughs> um so that's and, how that and, came and, about. And uh, Cindy's one of the, the biggest studio musicians in New York, right? Oh, tremendous, tremendous right. singer and touring, you know, with mm -hmm. God, she's been, she's been out with everybody. Pink Floyd. Um, wow. Well, she's just a tremendous singer. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So the systems, Mike Murphy and David Frank joined me here on Joe Kelly radio. And we've been talking about, uh, the beginnings of the system and radio and become all this notoriety. And um, I wanted, you know, last, last time you were on, you guys were talking about, you know, you're working with Prince and Rick James on that tour. And I was listening back to some of that and that, that must've been incredible tours, but a little strenuous at times. Right. Cause you were for clear. We're going back to clear. David was in the band and, and Mike, you were a road manager, right? What did that entail as road manager? Well, I was, I was like road managing and doing the live sound at the concerts. Oh, so okay, wow. Road managing is you do everything. <laughs> you're on call, roadie, live sound. You're collecting the money. You're pay doing the payroll. You're directing them. I mean, literally, I cut my teeth and learned every part of the business. You know, I met all the promoters. I think it helped us at some point later because, you know, I knew a lot of these promoters. I knew a lot of, a lot of these, the real road guys, they've been doing it forever. So when we came on the scene, they were very helpful. You know, the, you know, the sound companies knew me. Um, they were very helpful. They, they really kind of guided us through it, particularly having never been in a, been a performer in a touring band. So, you know, there was this kind of camaraderie and also a lot of people rooting for me, you know, like, because I had been on road crews and these guys, a lot of them, you know, may have at one point wanted to be a musician and make records and stuff. So kind of vicariously through me, they had that experience. So we, right. we were lucky right. to get a lot of help from, you know, other people that we had met on the road. So you guys yeah. were clear was the opener and then Prince and then Rick James, I think on the order on that triple bill, right? Yeah. Clear was the opener Prince and then Rick James, which was, one of the greatest tours of all time. It really could was. You, could you tell right away, like the second album, Prince, Prince was going to be the great performer that he was? Oh, yeah. He was tremendous. At, that tour was mm -hmm. one of the best tours ever. Um, right. The competitiveness, you know, Prince with his small band and his six foot of stage <laughs> was able to light it up and really, really give Rick James a run for the money. And you could, you could tell. You really right. could tell that he was going to be a big star. Right. Wow. And Rick James, of course, a legend in his own, you know, just, 100%. you're right. What a great tour it must have been. Oh, yeah, it was, it was amazing. So the system's right here, David Frank and Mike Murphy, and you yeah. guys have been working on new music. Uh, we're going to, you know, in just a few moments, get into People Get Up. Um, what, what's working on this new record? I mean, it sounds exciting. You guys working on a lot of tracks and on both coasts, but what, what is it going to be? And you have a title too, right? Yeah. Well, the title is time stretching and, you know, of course there's a technical aspect of time stretching with music where you can take items of various tempo and stretch them to fit the framework of what you're doing now. And in a lot of ways it refers back to the way we make music. I mean, because we've been able to, stretch our time making music from 1982 to today. <laughs> right. So right. it kind of encompasses the music that we started out with. And then, you know, as you know, if you followed our music, we've gone through eras where the music became more sophisticated and kind of we've developed, continued to develop the sound. So this record is a continuation of that idea. Right. And that's the way life can be, you know, time stretching also like it, it kind of has a lot of meaning in terms of people about how time kind of folds over itself. And sometimes you can kind of think when, when people go, 
wow, I remember wh whatever age you are, if you're in your 20s, you're going, wow, I just remember when I was like eight years old and I was in whatever. And it seems like yesterday. And that's exactly what it is with life a lot of times and making music. You know, you, make, you can make music for, for years and it still has just as much meaning as it did and almost seems like it's just out of sequence, you know, going, you know, from from 18, from uh, 1983 to 2020, you know, and then back to 1992 or whatever. And just uh, it's not necessarily all in sequence. So do you guys prefer, you know, you know, for the latest, you guys have been indie artists putting out the music yourselves as opposed to when, you know, you had to crank out a record every every year and was it a lot more pressure back then or do you prefer it now? Well, it was a lot more, pr it was more pressure then, but I think I would, I prefer to have the pressure. How about you, Mike? <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, listen, it's not just the pressure. Look, when you're it's trying to be, when you're, when you're, when you're making music, writing music, recording the music, that in itself is like a full time job. So now, right presenting the music, getting it performed, getting it licensed, all of the, the ancillary stuff that goes along with making music and getting it out to the public. Wow, that's a whole other realm that a lot of times you kind of take for granted, to be honest. Um, we never really got, we never really had a lot of pressure from the record company because we were doing something so unique, they really couldn't figure out how we were doing it. I mean, you know, it took a few years for other bands to come along and do it in a similar way in terms of the technology. But they basically kind of left us alone. They gave us money and said, OK, we like your record. We like to have the record by a certain date. So mm -hmm. for me, I didn't feel that pressure. I think it's the same pressure we put on ourselves now to always kind of outdo ourselves and make the next better record. Right. Mm -hmm. Um but I definitely, I definitely hope we can find a partner <laughs> to help yeah. do that distribution promotion piece because it right. takes a lot of energy. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, you know, the system longevity, this, I, I guess it's 38 years together making yep. music mm -hmm. and still going strong. And uh, before we get into to the newer cut, I wanted to play something from the second record, which, which I love as well. Ex Perfect. Experiment. I want to make you feel good, which kicks off the record. And uh, we'll come back and speak once again to David Frank and Mike Murphy of this system right here on Joe Kelly Radio. All right. That is from the Systems Experiment record came out in 1984. I want to make you feel good. Mike Murphy and David Frank join us and uh, they great, great guys and they've been on the show. Uh, and it's always an honor because they're, you know, they're one of the cornerstones of my musical upbringing um since the get-go so um let's talk about uh oh before i get into that i want to give you give you some insight um we started telling people this is going to we're recording pre-recording this but it's going to be up on our site at a, at a certain day in a couple of days but musicians have been like texting or on social media coming out and they're happy you guys are on again musicians so you guys are really re respected in the business and I got to say what's up to Reggie Washington, basis from New York. Hey. And, uh, you know, everybody's excited. So you, you guys probably hear that through the industry, right? Your influence on musicians? Yeah, we get a lot of people saying they can't wait. <laughs> right. <laughs> hear what we yeah. picked up. Right, and, right. Um, there's, there's been many, many people that have, that have come to us and said, um, you know, that they – that they became musicians actually from, mm -hmm. from, you know, after, from being inspired by us, which is a great thing. And David, I know, I know you're a big fan and uh, of Bernie Worrell and George Duke, two of the greats who, yeah. who were on our show and passed away. And yes. um, you, you had a chance to talk with Bernie, right? You guys met up. Uh, yes, I did. I, I did. I met up with him at the NAM show. That's right. We must've talked about that last time we were on and, I think so. and not all. Yeah. And that was a, and when I talked to him, he said, I said, hi, uh, you know, uh, I've always wanted to meet you. You know, you're like my idol. I copied all the no all the things that you played. And, and he went and he said, oh, that's nice. I said, I'm David Frank from the system. And he went, don't disturb this group. And he started oh, singing. Wow. <laughs> you're in my system. It was great. 
I mean, it was such a because Bernie Worrell was like the guy, you know, Parliament Funkadelic. I would just sit there by the, you know, looking at the speaker and trying to figure out all the notes that he played and on everything. And, yeah. Yeah. I told and, you that and- I might have told you this. The biggest mistake I made in my radio career was when Bernie, he brought, came up from New Jersey with like three, four keyboards, his keyboard tech. And I only had, he only played like one, one and a half minutes on the keyboards. Because, well, we, I was happy Chris France and Tina Weymouth with the Tom Tom plug came in because yeah. they're, you know, wow. they're, they're friends. But I could have had Bernie do a, a mini concert in the studio. Oh, my God. He was such a great musician. By the way, George Duke lived in Topanga, which is where I live. Topanga is oh, right wow. near Malibu in L.A., you know, wow. L.A., California. Yeah, he came on the show because Jeff Lee Johnson, I don't know if you know, Jeff played guitar in his band. Uh, uh, he, he passed away and we did a tribute and George came on. And George passed away like three, four months after that. Oh, yeah. Well, great guys. Yeah. Great guys. So let's talk about what's going on today. Um, time stretch to the LP, but the single People Get Up, which is really moving. You've got some special guests on here, Sandra St. Victor and Grandmaster Melly Mel. Talk about your affiliations and including them on this. Okay. So it's, it's odd because. Um, Actually, before I was a road manager with Clear, <laughs> right. I was a, a sound man on a tour, on the tour, with Grandmaster Flash and the Furious Five and the wow. Sugar Hill Gang and the Sequence. We did oh, yeah. wow. a yellow school bus tour of the South. Now, I don't uh, know what year it was. It must have been because it was before, um, it was before Grandmaster Flash and Furious Five blew up with uh, what was the it? Message, uh, the message, the message, the message. Yeah, I don't know what year that came out, but it was out. But it was just starting to, it was just starting to percolate. So, the Sugar Hill Gang had a full, full-on tour bus, and mm-hmm. Grandmaster Flash and the Furious Five. We were literally in a yellow school bus wow. with hard seats. <laughs> Hard seats and that door that the bus driver opens with the swinging arm. <laughs> I'm serious. I'm serious. Right, right. Yeah. So, um, so we're on the road. And what was great for me was I was getting paid a weekly salary, right, for the gigs, mm-hmm. per gig. Right. Um, and Sugar Hill Gang would tip me $100 to make sure they were louder than Grandmaster Flash and Furious 5. And Grandmaster Flash and Furious Five tipped me a hundred to make sure they were louder than the Sugar Hill Gang. <laughs> so, so now, I'm wow. from I'm from Jamaica Queens. It's like you know, it's not really, it's not so ghetto. Like it's right. not, it's it's very civilized. You know what I'm saying? Um, mm-hmm. And and these guys were a little rough around the edges. You know, from Newark, New Jersey, Plainfield. You know, a little rough. So. I can remember coming back home <laughs> from the chore and having all this money, like a, a lot of money, you know, more than I probably had ever made in music ever. Right. And just being very concerned that I might not make it. <laughs> <laughs> I might not make it home, but they found out how much money I had. Right. But, uh, <laughs> anyway, that's where I first met Grandmaster uh, Melly Mel. So flash forward, I don't know about 20 something years, I did a single with um, Lloyd Harvey, a friend of ours who has a label out of the UK and mm-hmm. he had gotten Melly Mel to do the rap. So we developed a relationship over time and he always said to me, hey, if, you're, and, you know, if the system ever does anything, you know, please don't hesitate to call me, man. I'd love to be on it. So I took him up on that, sent him the track um, and he responded like two days later. Well, it took him like a week to actually respond and say he liked it, but I think maybe he hadn't listened to it or he was busy. But when he finally heard it, he immediately said, man, I love this. I'm on this. Give me a few days. And within a few days, he sent the rep. I don't even think I told David that I was going to send it to Melly Mel. But when I got it back and sent it to David, he just, he loved it. He loved it. Um, So that was kind of the beginning of it. And then Sandra St. Victor She was in the family stand. We were both signed to Atlantic. Both of her bandmates I had known for years, going back to when I was in playing in club bands. You know, Jeff Smith was in a band called Common Sense and my band. We used to kind of be competitive because we were both horn bands. I'm going back a lot of years. And um, so I went to see 
uh, the Black Rock Coalition event at right. Lincoln Center in the summer, beginning of the summer. And um, I heard her sing and I'm like, wow, what a voice. So when I was, we, we decided we were going to release this song and I'm building on it. I was like, wow, I'd love to get Shaka Khan on this, but you know, that's a, that's kind of a pipe dream. So I mm -hmm. thought who else could do justice to the song and bring the fire it deserves. So I reached out to Sandra and at first she was a little hesitant because she lives in the Netherlands and she gave me recommendations, you know, well, why don't you get Audrey? Or why don't you get this one? Or why? I was like, no, 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 no. I need your fire on this. I need you. I right. need that rawness. She was like, well, you know, I'm not a soprano. I'm not, you know, I don't see. I'm like, no, no, that's what I need. I need your edge. So eventually she acquiesced mm -hmm. and she sent me like a real quick demo she did, which was like perfect. I said, okay, just add a little bit more hot sauce and we are good to go. So that's what we ended up with. And she just did a fantastic job. I can't say enough about it. And then, you know, from that, we became like real, real friends. Like, I don't want to say pen pals because now it's like we FaceTime each other, but we really have gotten in deep because she's always been on the forefront of black awareness and social issues. And, you know, me, maybe not so much, but she's inspired me in a lot of ways. And it's been like a real, really wind in our sails as we continue to move this song forward. I, I got a quick funny story about Sandra St. Victor. She uh, she opened up for the time at, at Tramps years ago. Wow. And the concert started. And all of a sudden, it, they looked like they were a little unsure on stage. Like they were looking for somebody to the side of the stage. They're like, where's Johnny? Johnny Kemp was singing background for her. And uh, he was in the bathroom. So it started off there like Johnny's in the bathroom and he came on stage a little embarrassed, but it was pretty funny. <laughs> <laughs> and, and she tore it up the old tramps. Yeah. Yeah. So the new, the new record time stretching, uh, looks like 2021 is going to be another, the system year, right? Absolutely. Yep. And, and how many, yep. how many tracks you got in the can already are almost ready to go? <laughs> I think we have like 10, 11 tracks already and um, we're like fine tuning them now, but we should be, we hope, I'm hoping we're finished in January and that we can release it in early March because okay. I'm realizing now how long it actually takes to get all the pieces in a row. Um, so we've, we've started with a lot of them, um, you know, getting the pieces, our ducks in a row, but it, it does take a lot to actually get the music out there. Yeah. And I, th I think with, um, you know, vaccines and hopefully things are getting a whole lot better with the pandemic and everything. I think music is just going to explode. People are just ready to go out and, and do their thing. You've been cooped up too long. Yep. Yeah. Way yeah. too long. I need yeah. to get out of here. Right. Need yeah, get, to, get to the finish line healthy, right? Yep. yep. Absolutely. Yeah, Most right. Important. There's a lot to do. Like, it's like, uh, you remember the idea of going out to dinner yeah, right. Remember that idea? Yeah. Or uh, actually, how about have it, we're going to have a party? Right, right. No. Yeah. <laughs> wow. <laughs> well, people are unfortunately still doing it. That's the problem. But I mean, well, most no, people, no, but I mean, you know, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I know. Most people like us are taking care of ourselves. Yeah. Right, right. Right. So I got to thank you, David, Frank, and, and Mike Murphy. You guys are real special in my radio show. And, and um, we're going to continue to show you the love here. Man, okay, Joe, Joe. Thank you so Joe, much. Thank you. It was a pleasure. Thank you for having the system on your show. We appreciate you, it. You got it. You guys always have a stage here, so you come back when the the new record's ready to go. All right. Okay. Great. So we're gonna have get a wonderful to, uh, day. 